And I'm with the Virginia SBDC Network, a partnership program between the U.S. Small Business Administration, George Mason University, and local host institutions throughout Virginia. In addition to the advising, training, and business information that the local SBDC office offices provide, we offer specialty programs such as the International Business Development Program or the IBD. The IBD program works with established firms to enhance their global success. Our certified global business professionals provide confidential advising, training, and customized research to help companies mitigate risk, prioritize markets, identify financing, and grow export sales. The Virginia SBDC IBD program has helped hundreds of Virginia companies from a variety of industry sectors to enter markets around the world. Today's webinar, Trade Talk, Leveraging Free Trade Agreements, is presented by the Virginia SBDC Network IBD program. We are recording today's presentation and it will be posted on our website, virginiasbdc.org. Everyone's microphone is muted and the chat feature is turned off, but if you have questions during the presentation, you can type those into the Q&A box. We have also enabled the live transcript function, which you can show or hide via your own meeting controls. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the Virginia SBDC's Aaron Miller, International Trade Director, and Dulce Zonizer, International Trade Specialist. Thank you so much, Sheila. And it's great to be here with everybody this morning and to have a chance to sit down with my colleague, Dulce Zonizer to talk about just one area of her expertise, which is uh, foreign trade agreements. And um, I know some of us probably have uh, some perspective on utilizing foreign trade agreements, but Dulce brings to the table really decades of experience in understanding how they're put together, where issues could exist in implementation, and how to make sure that businesses are fully benefiting from the agreement that our governments have negotiated. So really excited to have uh, Dulce here. Um, just uh, before we get really dive into things here, Dulce, can you just tell us a little bit about your background and how you got involved in international trade? Sure. Um, first, thank you for this opportunity and, and thanks to Sheila as well. I'm, I'm delighted to be with everybody today. Um, yeah, I, I grew up in, in, in international trade world. Um, my family business was actively engaged in, in trade. My parents were keenly interested in foreign affairs and policy and trade. They were both post-World War II kids, so they wanted us to know about the bigger world. Um, but growing up in Western New York, our family business was 60 miles from the Canadian border. We had branches in Niagara Falls and other places across the state. So it was a natural trading partner. So I didn't know anything else but international trade growing up. Um, my dad was always going across the border. He sold pipes, valves, manifolds, pressurized gauges, and industrial support products for industry, for manufacturing, for um, the power sector, um, and extractive industries was another area that he, he was actively involved in, uh, for instance, oil and gas. Um, back in the 80s, there was something called the oil boom um, and the North Sea uh, off the coast of the United Kingdom and the Gulf of Mexico were really starting to develop along with our Texas assets. And so my dad was selling into those markets and obviously he had to set up international um, businesses in order to facilitate those. So we had an operation in the UK. Um, and following that, I started studying at American University in poli sci and economics, and it was really the start of a really exciting time in trade. Um, I was becoming more aware of things because the U.S. free trade agreements were kicking off. Uh, the U.S.-Israel agreement was established in 1985, right in the middle of my or at the end of my college career. Um, the wall fell in 1989, and I was actually working for an organization where we took it upon ourselves to take trade missions, business people, over to the these new markets to try and figure out opportunities where we could work together. And um, so that was that was pretty neat. And then 1992, NAFTA was coming online. That was obviously in my world that was creating more opportunity for my family business, but it was also creating an opportunity for businesses across the country. Fast forward to 2001, and I was asked um, to join the George W. Bush administration, and I became a senior executive at the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. It was the U.S. government agency supporting U.S. 
uh, investment in emerging economies. It's now the Development Finance Corporation. And I was working very closely with Export Import Bank and U.S. Trade and Development Agency and the U.S. Department of Commerce and, you know, name the agency. And I was working with them and, and trade was a really major part of, of our administration. I served all eight years there. Um, over the course of my career, I was able to work in 44 countries around the globe. So I was seeing the impact of trade pretty regularly. Um, but one of the really interesting things, and I think it's salient to this conversation today, is um, when I was at OPEC, CAFTA-DR, the Central America Dominican Republic Free Trade Agreement, entered into force. Um, we saw the negotiations going on with the U.S. Trade Representative, and my boss at the time, Rob Mosbacher, I was his chief of staff, he said, look, I really want this agency to play a role in making sure that this agreement is a success. So we were working very closely with small businesses on both sides of the transaction to help make CAFTA DR a success. So that was a really neat opportunity for me to see how free trade agreements actually operate and how much they can benefit an economy. Great. So really, you're just bringing experience both from the private sector, from family experience, seeing the evolution of, of trade and hopefully the efficiencies that were gained throughout the years for your family business, all the way to, you know, enacting um, a free trade agreement yourself or, or as part of a government initiative. Um, you know, you mentioned CAFTA DR, that's one of our free trade agreements that we have, but perhaps before we go too much further, can we get a working definition of what a free trade agreement is um, and how they differ or what other kinds of trade relationships that we have with other countries? Yeah, sure. Um, actually, I'll address the free trade agreement aspect on the, on the back end of this because you really have to kind of build the house in order to get to a free trade agreement. So let's just talk about a trade agreement in general. Um, a trade agreement is an agreement between two or more countries where they negotiate and agree to certain obligations, certain commitments um, with regard to the exchange of trade in, in goods and services. Um, and they will look at certain other bells and whistles like protecting investment in that particular market. They'll look at um, pro in, uh, intellectual property rights and making sure that there's a strong uh, commitment to protecting IP as it crosses the border. Um, they'll maybe look at trade facilitation, making sure that there are trade elements in place at the customs uh, or at the port where goods would come in, where it would move more quickly. So we're always looking to improve on, on, on certain trade situations when we negotiate these trade agreements. Now, there's something also called most favored nation status. And most favored nation status is, is born out of an agreement, uh, the General Agreement on Trade Tariffs and Trade that was established uh, following World War II, where they developed um, an agreement, a multinational, multilateral agreement, where everybody would recognize um, duty at a, at a common place. So they built a ceiling in on duties. And they said, OK, anybody that signs this agreement, this GATT agreement, will benefit from preferential trade. We will keep it at, let's say, 4.9% for anybody who signed this and maybe 6% for anybody who didn't sign the GATT. Um, so they said, basically, and then we'll look to lower these rates over time. So you may have heard WTO or, or negotiating rounds like the Uruguay round or the Kennedy round where everybody got together, sat at a table and tried to negotiate down rates. So that most favored nation state, uh, most favored nation status is really an important cornerstone to free trade. One of the things that happened is um, the European Union in the 1960s said, hey, we're going to we want to we want to lower some rates for our local community. And so they established uh, a customs union. And then in 1980s, the Reagan administration kicked off all these free trade agreement negotiations um, with Israel and with and with um, various other countries. And we did 20 free trade agreements between 1985 and 2020. We finished up with um, uh, uh, Colombia and Panama in my admin in the administration I worked in. And then recently we did the U.S. Mexico Canada free trade agreement, which was was a renegotiation of NAFTA. So when we look at the free trade agreements, we have to recognize that they are one of these multinational agreements. They are um, 
free trade is not always free trade. What they're doing is they're negotiating managed trade. Um, they're negotiating something called preferential trade, where if you are my trading partner and we agree to this, we're going to lower rates for you. It's, it's going to be beyond most favored nation or it's going to be equal to most favored nation. Um, what the what the free trade agreements do is they say, OK, we want to lower these rates, but we want to do it through some form of a definition. And usually it's how much content do you have? If you buy something from China and bring it into the United States and ship it off to a free trade partner, they're going to say, no, 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 you're just a pass through. We're looking for content. We want to make sure that the sourcing of that product is coming from you or one of the partner countries that's a signatory. So if you are doing the US-Israel free trade agreement, if you're tapping into that, you have to have 35% US content or Israel Israeli content or a combination of both. Same thing with US-Canada, MCA, USMCA. We have Canada, we have the US, we have Mexico, and we can do any iteration to make sure we meet those standards. Now, the minimums have changed over time. Remember, Israel was the earliest one at 35%. Now we're in 2020, and we're looking at 62% content for certain goods um, as part of USMCA. So you have to look at that from, from a content perspective. And then the second piece is, way back in the day, they negotiated this thing called the Harmonized Tariff System, which is a num numeric list of products. Um, and they are tied directly into what the duty charge is going to be. And so when you look at free trade agreements, they will identify harmonized codes that are eligible for this benefit of free trade or uh, preferential trade where you may benefit from a reduced rate over your most favored nation status. That may be a lot of jargon that I've just shared with you, but uh, we try to make this as, as accessible as we can. And, and that, that's the best I was able to do. <laughs> hey, that's that's great. It's not... Uh... It's, it's a subject that has some complications and it's great to have um, just an, an baseline, so to speak, for us uh, moving forward on this. So uh, when it comes to the most favored nation, essentially MFN, what you were referring to, that sets the, uh, the floor for countries and their trading relationships for anybody who is part of the World Trade Organization and free trade agreements and build on that, deepening those preferences between countries based on the agreement that they that they come to. Um, so that's a that's a really important distinction in in this whole thing as well. So you know, Dulcie, in our role, we often help companies to find the right market. Uh, for them, or they come to us with a number of different markets in mind, and we want to help them prioritize those markets and which one is going to be the best fit for them, given where they are uh, at that time. Um, how how does that fit into, how do FTAs, uh, uh, signatories with our U.S. government, fit into the prioritization of markets. And can you talk a little bit just about the role, um, how services are included in this as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's let's talk about duty first, because really the business community is looking for how can I make my good competitive? How can I make my good accessible in a market? So the free trade agreement um, addresses a major a major issue, which is duty or tariffs, that's uh, the duty and tariffs are equal in, in their definitions. Um, and you have to remember that duty or tariffs are paid by the buyer. So if, if, if a duty goes into a particular marketplace, often it's designed to protect an industry. Not always, but for the most part, it's designed to, 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 to protect an industry. So by reducing those duties, you're introducing competition into the market. But what you're also doing is um, you, if you are lowering your duty, you are reducing expense for your buyer. Your, your, buyer, your buyer pays the duty. Your buyer has the obligation to carry that, that charge. Um, so by using an, a free trade agreement, you're hopefully eliminating that, that duty obligation. You are making your goods cheaper for your buyer. So it would make absolutely great sense to pick a market where they don't have to have that markup, you know, and duty rates can go from half a percent to the sky's the limit, depending on how much that country wants to protect that, that industry. 
Um, the other thing that's important about free trade agreements, and and one of the gentlemen that I used to work with, um, Secretary Powell, always said, capital is, is, is coward. You don't necessarily want to go to a market where you see inconsistencies or instability in terms of your duty regime. You want free trade agreements in that market because they lock in. They're In most cases, they're permanent. Um, most of the free trade agreements are permanent. They're designed for telling the marketplace we have a consistent pricing for duty or no duty. We're stable. We have a mutual agreement in terms of the terms and conditions of that free trade agreement. And they are, and the, the agreements are called entry into force. They are enforced. So it's a really, and, and the communication between the two countries continues. But for the most part, you have a clear, transparent, stable environment by which to tap into. So let's now switch to the services side of things. So sometimes free trade agreements can, they're old and they need to be renegotiated, reopened. And a perfect example of this was the NAFTA USMCA transition. Um, the agreement was old, it was uh, about 27 years old and it needed to be modernized. And so it was opened, they negotiated. There were not a lot of changes, but one of the things that they did was they addressed some of the latest um, issues with, with commerce. Um, E-commerce was one of the issues, but services was definitely re-fortified re, uh, in terms of how important services are to both our, to all our economies. So not only did the USMCA have services, but when you start looking at some of the other agreements, the Australia FTA, um, they have uh, made an accommodation for services. Life insurance is one of them. You wouldn't think of that naturally. Express delivery services is a major issue for them. Um, Bahrain, uh, financial information, data processing, financial advisory services. That's another one that is very important. That was done in 2006. Um, and then Korea has also opened up a wide array of U.S. services um, uh, for uh, providers and investors. Um, and that was done in 2010. So services are definitely, um, they shouldn't be overlooked when you are looking at a free trade agreement and the opportunity to develop your market there. Great. Um, so, you know, I think just kind of going to that first part of the question and why it's so important when we're looking at prioritizing markets, a lot of our small businesses they want stability, right? They want predictability. And these free trade agreements signal to the businesses that, hey, we're going to play by the rules. We want you here. We want your business here. Um, and we have entered into this agreement with uh, your government to, to ensure that we're both benefiting from this. And so it's kind of that predictability that is so uh, key and why it would be important for companies, especially small businesses that can't take big, you know, risky swings uh, without bearing the, all those repercussions. That's a really important reason um, for that as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the services being part of these new negotiations. And I just want to highlight for our group, and this will put this in the, the chat to share with everybody, uh, but uh, Dulce and myself and a few others from our Virginia DC District Export Council will be giving a program on September 17th and 19th on practical considerations for exporting services where we'll touch on some of these issues about, uh, about um, you know, utilizing free trade agreements to sell services and how that can help you uh, as well and breaking down some of these non-tariff barriers. So great. Well, what kind of misconceptions are out there about FTAs? Ah, uh, yes, the misconceptions. <laughs> Um, well, the first one is an FTA, a free trade agreement does not always mean free. Um, in most cases, I think I've referenced this several times now, um, you know, we, we hear free, we often will see free, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee free. Um, it might be cutting duty in half from most favored nation status. That's still a win. Um, Often, and you may have heard me say this on several occasions so far in the session, we call free trade agreements preferential trade. 
because we are creating an environment to have a preferred trading partner. So that's just, you know, if you hear free trade agreement, it's not necessarily free, do your homework. Um, free trade agreements are easy. Why don't we have more of them? They're actually really hard to negotiate. They take years to negotiate. Um, we don't have a lot of them for a reason because they are super hard. And it is really a great accomplishment when both governments can concur and get ratification of this. Um, you know, we don't have one with the European Union. We don't have one. And we they're one of our largest trading partners. They are more than a half a billion person market. And we don't have a free trade agreement with them. We don't have a trade agreement with the UK. Everybody thought, well, they'll leave Brexit and we'll just go ahead and give them a free trade agreement. Yeah, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, a perfect example. 2013, Obama says he's going to crack the back of uh, the EU and we're going to get a trade agreement. And he kicks off the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TTIP. Um, they got into it. They negotiated with, in good faith, God love the president for really putting a lot of steam behind it, but they could not get to critical mass. Um, there were a host of issues. And I will say the agricultural chapter is always a challenge. I don't care where it is, but we have GMOs, they don't. That was an impasse right there. There were other various issues with agricultural, um, uh, the agricultural sector that were, were giving everybody a lot of heartburn and we couldn't get there. And then there's data. They are very, very protective of their data. We want a more liberal data environment. Couldn't get there. So as a result of that, they suspended conversations in 2016 and finally 2019, it was declared that it was it was not going to go forward. It, it ended without an agreement. So that was that demonstrates we're very like minded. We're their largest ally. We couldn't get there. Um, one of the things that um, everybody thinks about is, you know, do we have a problem with the country? Do we have an issue with the country? Why don't we have an FTA? We're friends, we're allies, we're like-minded countries, but an FDA just cannot materialize. And you know it does not reflect on a negative relationship. So if you see a market that you wanna work in and we don't have an FTA, it doesn't mean that we don't have a great relationship with that country, we just don't have an FTA. And we will have MFN no matter what. Um, one of the big things that I, and I talk to companies about this all the time, uh, Aaron and I both do, an FTA lifts all rules. No, it doesn't. You still have to meet all the regulatory requirements. Um, you absolutely will have to create, you will still have to deal with all the safety standards. You will have to deal with export controls. You'll have to deal with all the, all the, the bells and whistles that are required in trade. It is only about duty. Um, so don't let, don't be misled that, oh, I've got a free trade agreement, therefore I don't have to deal with this. I, I probably have this conversation with a company once a week about the fact that free trade agreements do not absolve you of all the other things that you have to comply with. That's that's so important uh, to know, right? That even when we're giving these preferences, we want to make sure that um, companies are complying with the rules set out of the free trade agreement. Um, and yeah, it's trade is documentation and accounting for, uh, where things come from. So in that vein, um, if a small business decides to export to an FTA country, what do they need to do to secure those benefits? I'm about to <laughs> just maybe talk a little bit as well about, uh, you know, the compliance for that. Is it always really onerous or not for companies? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this might take a few minutes. Um, and I will say, just framing this, the SBDC, the Virginia SBDC, or if you're not in Virginia, if you're in another place, your SBDCs can help you with a lot of the items that we're going to talk about. Um, so the first one is an easy one. Know before you go, do your research. Know your requirements before you ship, before you even get into that country. Make Do your research online. Talk to your SBDC. Talk to your, your state economic development. Talk to the Department of Commerce. Um, but know before you go. And, and we definitely, we help, we help companies every day of the week with, with this. Another thing that you need to do, um, you need to get your goods classified to the correct HS code. 
a harmonized system code. Remember I talked about free trade agreements are tied in with the HS system. So you need to know your HS code in general, and you need to know it for the country that you're going into. If you, I, I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but if you classify it against the U.S. harmonized tariff system of the U.S., that's only for the U.S., for bringing goods into the United States. If you are shipping to uh, uh, Israel or you're shipping to Canada, they're going to have a different number. Uh, so you're going to need to know that. You're also going to have to know something called the Schedule B number, which is a U.S. only number, and it is part of your export documentation. Again, we can help I know I'm giving you probably some gobbledygook here. We can help you translate that. Um, make sure you know how your product's made in terms of content. Um, we have companies where they may have done something with textiles and they thought they were sourcing something from Mexico and they actually were sourcing something for Turkey, which negated their eligibility for free trade across the US, Canada, Mexico uh, transaction. Um, it is important that you know where each article is coming from, what the value is, and there are sophisticated calculations that you can do to figure out where you where you fit in that in that free trade agreement. So again, we can help you with this, but it's important for you to have a handle on that before you ship, before you start sharing information with the customs people in the importing country. Know your documentation requirements, really important. The free trade agreements do stipulate certain things that you need to do. Now, um, there's something called a certification of origin or a certificate of origin. Um, that is a document that basically tells the customs people, this is the percentage of, of, of originating goods that meet the free trade agreement obligation. And it's a statement that in with a US, Canada, Mexico, it's now no longer a, a long form that the US government provides. You have to, there's there are nine points you have to satisfy in a letter or on your custom or commercial invoice. They've they've given a lot of flexibility there. Um once you've got your completed documents, you have to double check them. You have to make sure that they're complete, you have to make sure that they're thorough and that they're compliant with the requirements of the free trade agreement. Um, when, you are, um, when you are providing information on your product content, um, you, will, you will have to make sure that you can back that up as well. Um, I wanna make sure that you understand, you can't just say, hey, I got 35% here and 12% there and 15% there. You're going to have to build a record keeping uh, um, document base so that if anybody ever asks, you can present it because sometimes they'll halt the doc the goods at the border and they'll say, please prove it. Um, the other thing that you may want to consider is um, how you're going to handle your, your documentation. Um, you're going to want to make sure that you are um, that you have a check system in place, that you maybe have a procedural system in place so that you can double check your thoroughness. But one of the things that is important is that you have a trusted freight forwarder on, in your back pocket. And that means probably interviewing a couple of them and getting comfortable with them because you can bounce things off of them. They're not going to tell you what is right and wrong because they're going to rely on the information you provide them. So you have to have great information, but they will help you go through that process. They will help you work through, um, and a customs broker as well, will help you work through all of the documentation that you need to, to provide and how you need to prepare it and how they want to see it prepared because they're the folks who have to get your goods through, through, through customs. Um, that should take care of a lot of the internal log jams that you may, you may face. Um, a little note about FedEx, UPS, and DHL. We love them, but they are not designed to hold your hand. They are not there to um, help you get through uh, the paperwork. They're not there to help you get through a lot of the headaches that you may be dealing with um, if you are shipping for the first time or even for the 15th time. They are there to get the goods from point A to point B. I find sometimes that when people use uh, these three service providers and goods get stuck at a customs uh, uh, authority, they're going to get stuck at a customs authority, which is why I really push for you to go and find a customs, uh, a freight forwarder slash customs broker who can work closely with you and help you if there's a big challenge. Um, again, I have no beef with FedEx, UPS, or DHL. They're great companies. It's just that if you're shipping stuff 
and you haven't done it before, if you're not familiar with the processes, that freight forwarder is going to be your lifeline. Um, and I would say that for any country, whether it's a free trade agreement country or any country, you need that, that help. And it's worth spending a little more money um, on your shipment and a little more time on your shipment to make sure that things go through correctly. Um, the last thing I want to mention, and this is really an important piece, when you hire a freight forwarder, freight forwarder does not carry liability on the information that they are sharing with customs or with, with the U.S. customs or with the, the importing country's customs. You want to make sure that you are providing the most accurate and correct information in the shipper's letter of instruction because if something goes wrong and customs comes back to the freight forwarder, they're going to point directly to you. This is the information I received from the exporter, and this is the information that I've got. I conveyed it. If customs opens up the box and finds out that the goods don't match, that's going to be a problem for you. So make sure that you have a very transparent and very forthright relationship with your freight forwarder. Those are a lot of great points that you made there, Dulcie. And just, um, you know, we've seen that even with experienced exporters, if they're shipping to a lot of different countries, um, they can be running into some or have some inconsistencies where they think their documentation is all, uh, they have this down, they know what they're doing, they start exporting to a new country, things start to, uh, you know, have some holes in them. And so it's so important that you have that that freight forwarder and that customs broker. There is going to be an investment of of time and money uh, to make the most out of a free trade agreement and trading with a partner in one of those countries. Uh, but you know that there is that investment in it. There's going to be a ton of benefits to come. Uh, but you need to you need to be aware of that. Of course, we also have had situations where uh, a company, we, we pitch them on, hey, you know, Canada, Mexico, this is a great, the USMCA is a great free trade agreement. Let's uh, focus there. There are neighbors, they're easier to get into. Um, they share a lot of the same time zone overlap with us. Uh, they're used to doing business with Americans, all of those things. Um, but it could be that the, the FTA doesn't prove to be the most uh, beneficial path uh, for them. Maybe you can talk about some of those examples and issues and kind of what are some of the common ways that uh, businesses, you know, are, are not successful or shouldn't be looking at uh, an FTA? Right. Well, I think there's a great example Um we have a client um, who uh, sells into Canada and their product is most favored nation status zero and FTA zero. And as I've mentioned before, the free trade agreements do require certain paperwork to be done. It's an additional burden, but it, it you know, and it requires you to make sure that, you know, all your content matches up and everything else. If you have most favored nation zero and free trade agreement zero, you're going to want to go with most favored nation status uh, 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 shipping because you can, and it's going to be less of a headache for you. Now, let's say three years down the road, Canada says, hey, most favored nation, we're going to change that to 3% because we have companies in our, in our, uh, in our market that are, that are doing the same thing and we want to protect that industry from them. So we're just going to bump up our, our, our duty rate to 3%. As I said before, the free trade agreements are permanent and they are long-term and they are predictable. And you can't just change the rate to 3% on a free trade agreement item. So then you would say, aha, that market now has become more expensive from the most favored nation status, but now I'm gonna switch over to the free trade agreement. I'm gonna go back in and get my goods in at zero. I'm gonna have a little more paperwork but I've at least cracked the back of or cracked the code in terms of if I can't use the one, I'm going to use the other. Um, the company that we work with right now does ship under most favored nation status. They do have reduced paperwork, but they know that that option is in their back pocket. Um, so that's, that's, the first, that's the first answer. Um, 
we have a lot of companies that get very frustrated with most favored or with uh, FTA agreements because there are obligations that they have to meet. And sometimes those can become frustrating. Um, and it does require that, paper, as I said before, paperwork has to be accurate. But what sometimes happens is somebody goes it alone. They start filling out paperwork or providing documentation and it's not right. And then all of the sudden, everything just piles up. It's like when you play Tetris and all of a sudden everything piles up at the end or one of those other video games where you, you've lost control of the game. And all of a sudden your goods are sitting in a warehouse. There are storage fees that are ramping up. Maybe your goods got rejected and returned to you. Again, it's a cost to you. Um, you want to make sure that you're not going it alone, that you are bringing in a trusted advisor, that you are doing your homework ahead of time. You still may have a bump in the road, but at least you have somebody to turn to. What happens is companies want to save money. They think they're saving time by going it alone. They do all this, inf they provide all this information. It's incorrect. Calculations are wrong, whatever. And it's all a self-inflicted wound because there are resources out there that can help you get through that process. Um, so my, my advice to any company is, yeah, there are things that can go awry, but you do have a lifeline. You do have people you can talk to. You have your freight forwarder. You have resources like the SBDC or, or other organizations. Commercial the Department service. of Commerce. I'm sorry, the commercial, the commercial service. service yeah, yeah, the commercial service does get phone calls a lot. I had a client who was selling, shipping something to a trade show and uh, they got a phone call, you know, my stuff is stuck in Dusseldorf and I need to get it cleared out. And, you know, Customs and Border Protection couldn't really help. Commercial service was helping to some degree. Um, but, you know, having a solid freight forwarder will stop the hunt and get you where you need to go. Yeah. Well, great. Well, I think uh, for the audience now, if you have any questions, please uh put them in the, the Q and A function. Uh, I have one last question for you, Dulcie. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a simple, broad one. I feel like we've covered a lot on, on free trade agreements. Um, and of course we can't get down to the company level specifics in a webinar that is, is geared for a broad audience like today. But what's one thing that you wish that all small businesses knew about free trade agreements. You're so asking an Irish to give you one item. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh God, this is really hard to pick because, you know, it, there are so many things and I guess they're all kind of in the same vein. Um, you know, I guess get that freight forwarder, get that customs broker. You know, FTAs are really really can be really challenging and you know they're designed to help small business but they don't they don't make it so easy for a small business to succeed without some help so i would say get a freight forwarder make sure that you're as smart as you can be on the the the, the free trade agreement and use the weapons to succeed and make sure that you have someone in your operation who is trained that knows more information about the free trade agreements or or in general trade i mean you know sometimes sometimes you need to know all of trade in order to use the free trade agreement effectively because you may have to weave and bob in and out of mfn um there's a lot online that you can learn there are a lot of trade associations that you that can help you um uh learn the aspects some key aspects of the free trade agreements um turn to the commercial service turn to the, the the state economic development organizations like the VEDP if you're in Virginia, um, the SBDCs, um, and make sure that you are really um, laying a foundation. Building a house of trade means you need a good solid foundation before you can get to the point where you're really being successful. So take your time. Don't be in react react mode. Be in proactive mode. That would be my advice. That's great advice. And that's so applicable, I think, to any, any aspect of international trade for a business. It's build your team out, know who your partners are, um, you know, prioritize where you can get things at no cost, where your tax dollars are at work, whether it's 
um, SBDC or the U.S. Commercial Service or a state trade office like the Virginia Economic Development Partnership. Um, and then where do you need to really hire somebody who's going to, to play a specific role that's going to make your life so much easier and, and have the familiarity with them uh, so that you're not just, you know, in the middle of a transaction and jumbling around trying to find that person who's going to, uh, you know, hopefully get you out of a situation or help you complete that transaction. Prepare ahead of time, build your team out, know what the roles are that different uh, people and agencies and organizations play, and then really, you know, be strategic about it. As you said, be proactive, find that right market and go for it. So uh, great advice, Dulce. And um, I think we, I don't see any questions in the, uh, in the Q and A here yet. So uh, this will be, this recording will be on our website. Feel free to um, check that out. Uh, if you want to go over anything, if you're a Virginia company, feel free to reach out to us. We're here um, at no cost to assist you in, in navigating this. And we look forward to seeing you next month. We'll have a, a special guest. It'll be a, a, a webinar that we do with both our craft beverage program and the international trade program. And we look forward to sharing more of those details with you here soon. But right now I'll turn things back over to Sheila. Thank you both. This was a lot of information, as Dulce said, <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot, <laughs> but all good information. Um, I'm guessing you covered everyone's questions, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is always a good thing, right? Um, but thank you again um, for being here with us today. And I want to thank everyone who attended as well. Um, and also, as a reminder, like Aaron said, you will receive an email that will have a link to this recording. So if you need to review it. Um, and if you would like to sign up for upcoming webinars or access recorded webinars, please visit virginiasbdc.org forward slash training. These resources are des designed to be used in collaboration with your local SBDC advisors. You can sign up for a free and confidential session by emailing help at virginiasbdc.org or via our website. And we do hope to see you at our next sessions. Take care, everyone.